the First Presbyterian Church of Corinth online. It's great to have you all join us online again as we continue our virtual worship during this new surge of COVID-19 and continue to try to wrestle with what our next steps should be. In the meantime, though, one thing I've been really grateful for is that we're a little better prepared to adapt to the reality around us now. And we actually have quite a few things that are coming up in the life of our church that I get to announce to you this morning. The first is this coming Saturday, January 23rd, there will be a snowshoe and cross-country skiing fellowship outing at Brookhaven Golf Course at 10 a.m. And you're welcome to come down for snowshoeing or skiing, uh, or to just bring a lunch and come join us afterwards for a tailgate uh, socially distanced lunchtime after the cross-country skiing and snowshoeing. The day after that, on January 24th, we will have the annual meeting of our congregation, but it will be virtual over the video platform Zoom. If you have a phone or if you're currently watching this service, you have the ability to join our meeting this coming week, uh, at least to watch it. If you have a computer or a phone, you can also participate. Um, what, we, what you'll need to do will be explained in an email this week. I'll send out information on how to join. Um, but we do encourage you, even though it might be a bit unusual, uh, to join our annual meeting next Sunday right after church. I'll try to start meeting up right around 11 o'clock a.m. Um, and even though it'll be virtual, it'll consist of the normal things. Our annual reports will be distributed in the week to come, um, and we'll be able to hopefully vote, and everything hopefully will run smoothly on Zoom for our annual meeting next week, January 24th. And then finally, one other virtual event I get to invite you to is one I'm especially excited for. Our denomination, ECO, is hosting their national gathering virtually on the weekend of January 29th to January 31st. I've gone to the past two national gatherings in person, and they've been some of my favorite events that I've ever attended. It's incredible to be united with other people from our denomination as they cast a vision for the future of our churches, as we gather to hear speakers and pray together and meet people from all over the country. Although the downside of it being virtual is we won't get to see those other people, the plus side of it being virtual is it means all of you are able to join as well. So I highly encourage you to watch one or two of these sessions. Uh, they'll be from Friday through Sunday, January 29th to 31st. I sent out the information for how to register in my email this past week, and I'll send it out again in the week to come. But again, I highly encourage you to hop online for part of the National Gathering, January 29th to 31st, to get an idea of what's going on in the life of our denomination. The final announcement is a more sobering one. I sent it out this week via email. It's an announcement that Jeannie Carter's mother, Dorothy Clothier, a longtime faithful member of this church, passed away after a lengthy battle with dementia. Services were held on Friday for Jeannie's mother, um, and I encourage you to continue to reach out to the family with your prayers and with your thoughts in the weeks to come as they continue to battle this grief at an incredibly challenging time. It's in that vein that we as a church family continue to gather in worship. Though the timing may be challenging, though the circumstances may be different, we continue to unite in worship of our Heavenly Father. So I invite you this morning to hear this call to worship from Psalm 96, verse 13. Sing before the Lord, for he comes, he comes to judge the earth. He will judge the world in righteousness and the peoples in his truth. Let us worship our God together this morning.
come now to a time of prayer where we will pray for our church community as well as our town community and the world around us. This morning we'll be spending some time in prayer for the Carter family as they grieve the loss of Dorothy this past week. And we'll also be continuing in prayer for all those in our town who are battling COVID-19 or the loss of loved ones in this battle as this challenge continues to grow. Uh, we'll pray for our town, our schools, our churches, our nation as we try to figure out what the wise steps are in the weeks to come. And we'll pray for the upcoming week as another potentially tumultuous time approaches our nation with the inauguration, the impeachment trial, the ongoing division, and the ongoing challenges we're facing. There's not much we can say as we face all these daunting challenges, but we do know who we can bring these challenges to. So as we feel the weight of the challenges facing our town and our families and our world, I invite you to a time of prayer as we give it all over to our Heavenly Father and prepare to hear his word from the scriptures. Let us pray together this morning. Almighty God, as we lay these requests down in front of you, it's clear that they are too heavy for us to bear. Just one of these weighty requests, the loss of a loved member of the congregation, the effects of a pandemic ravaging our town, and the challenge of division in our nation through another round of arguments and political dissension, disagreement, fear, violence, anger, criticism, as we face all of these weights that are so bearing us down, that doesn't even take into account those of us who are dealing with broken relationships, broken families, our own illnesses, our mental health, our sad emotions as we just miss and grieve all the things that we've lost in the past year. It is too heavy for us to bear them all, but Lord, you promise us that we do not have to carry the weights but that instead we can bear them in prayer to you, for your Son, Jesus Christ, offers us a yoke that is light and a burden that is easy. So it is with trust that you can carry the weight of the world that weighs so heavily on our shoulders that we put these things into your hands. Will you provide comfort and care to the Carter and Clovier families? Will you provide healing to our land and wisdom as we try to figure out how to best balance the concerns of our town and the challenges we're facing with the pandemic. Will you please give wisdom and bravery and courage and clarity to our governments? We pray for your peace and your presence as another week of potentially divisive times occurs. We pray for your protection over our nation. And we pray for our new president being sworn in this week, that you will give him wisdom, that you will give him guidance to lead our nation well in the times to come. Father, we pray for all those who have been affected by the challenges of this past week, and we pray that as we face uncertain times, that we can look to the one who never changes, but is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. The scripture reading will be from Genesis chapter 6, verses 5 through 8. The Lord saw how great man's wickedness on the earth had become, and that every inclination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil all the time. The Lord was grieved that he had made man on the earth, and his heart was filled with pain. So the Lord said, I will wipe mankind whom I have created from the face of the earth, men and animals and creatures that move along the ground and birds of the air, for I am grieved that I made them. 
but Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. This is God's word. One thing we've gotten very good at over the years is sanitizing Bible stories, making them a little more G-rated than they might have actually been. Maybe the primary example is David and Goliath. In the story of David and Goliath, you have what's one of the more common kid stories that's really not much of a kid story at all. One teacher I had told about reading this to his son who was getting in the habit of throwing things. And he found himself skipping over parts of the story. David threw the rock, the giant fell down, the Israelites won. You know, we skip over some of the more gruesome parts of a very brutal story. The stone sinks into the giant's forehead. David cuts off Goliath's head with his own sword. He brings the head of Goliath back to Jerusalem. It's a really gruesome story. And we do the same thing with the story of the flood. If you, like me, grew up in a pastor's home or a Christian home, you might be familiar with Noah as the big, white, bushy beard Noah, with his happy little animals and his happy little boat floating along on the water as he learned the names of the different animals. But in reality, the story of the flood probably looked a lot more like this. In the story of the flood, you have rain, you have downpour, you have death, you have destruction, you have evil. I chose not to use the image that had people drowning in the water. These are the types of stories that we like to avoid. It's legendary that Thomas Jefferson would cut out parts of his Bible where he didn't like what Jesus would say. And we might not go to that extent, but in practice, we might do it. We read through Genesis, we get to the story of the flood, and we skip it over. We're more eager to get to the Jesus that loves the little sparrows and all the little children than that angry, violent God who destroyed the whole earth. Why would he do such a thing? What in the world could we take from that story today? These are the types of stories that are really hard for us to wrap our minds around, often really hard for non-Christians to wrap their minds around. Who would want to be in a relationship with a violent God who would obliterate his whole creation? And what do we have to learn from it today? Well, as we look at the story of the flood, my hope is that we'll see two things. After all, God wouldn't have included this in the scriptures if he didn't want us to know something about him. That's what we're doing in this sermon series. We're asking, who is God? What does he want us to know about him? And how does that change us? And we're going to see about God's feelings towards sin and his judgment of sin, but we're also going to see his redemption of sin. I don't know about you, but over the past few months of COVID-19, I've experienced COVID-19 fatigue. I've found myself getting more and more impatient, more and more irritable, more and more angry, more and more bitter. My fuse is growing shorter. And many of us are experiencing the same thing. The thoughts of our hearts might not come out in our actions, but if people knew some of the things we thought, some of the ways we judged people who approached things differently, some of the things we thought even towards people we love, let alone towards the strangers who cut us off on the highway, people would be pretty embarrassed. Indeed. See, as we get into the story of the flood, what I want to do is focus on what I think God wants us to see in this narrative. Like with last week, I'm going to try to avoid getting bogged down on some of the questions we might have, like, was the flood global, or was it just the inhabited world? Or where is Noah's ark? Have we found it? Can we dig up the remnants of his ark? And how did that guy know how to build boats anyways? We can get bogged down on the scientific questions, which are really fun to explore and worth learning about how the flood might have impacted geology and trying to understand its historicity, seeing it in other ancient myths. But that's not the focus of Genesis 6. Here's the focus of Genesis 6. It wants to show us who is God and why did he destroy the earth but save Noah. 
Because in his word to us, God wants us to know who he is and what his relationship is to us. Here's what we learn today. We learn that God judges sin, but God saves sinners. God judges sin, but God saves sinners. When we think of our sinful selves showing up in COVID fatigue, we can do one of two things. We can either say, oh my goodness, I'm such a terrible person. Now God will really see who I am. Now everybody will really see who I am. There's no hope for me. This is just sad and pathetic. I'm just going to go back to my old sinful habits. People have gotten wrapped back up in addictions, in sinful nature, and sinful habits all over again. Or we can go to the other side and say, you know, like, yeah, maybe I get a little angry or bitter or judgmental sometimes, but it's not that big of a deal. It's not like I've killed someone or committed adultery. And we can not make too big of a deal out of our sin. Yet, in reality, we're growing further and further from God. Here's what God wants us to see as we face our own crisis today and the effects it's having on our own sin and our own walk with God. God hates and judges our sin. And he's serious about the sin in our lives, even the little sins. But God also saves sinners. And he wants to free you from the sin that's dogging you. And he wants to transform your life. How can he do that? Why does he do that? Why does he want to do that? That's what we get to learn in the flood story this morning. We begin with God judging sin as we look at verse 5. The Lord saw how great man's wickedness was on the earth, and that every inclination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil all the time. That's pretty bad, <laughs> right? Like, oh, every inclination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil all the time? How can you make that any worse? And you, you could add, like, for real, I mean it at the end of the verse, but it's a pretty serious indictment of humanity. Is it possible God's exaggerating? Is humanity really that bad? Well, let's take a look at what's going on in the surrounding chapters. Firstly, in Genesis 3, we saw the first sin last week. Adam and Eve ate from the tree they weren't supposed to. Not good, not the worst thing ever. Next chapter, Cain kills his brother Abel. Okay, murder's pretty bad. This is going downhill rather quickly. But if you look at the end of chapter 4, at the end of the genealogy, we find a man named Lamech, who is Cain's great-great-great-great-great-grandson, who also kills someone, but he brags about it to his wives. He says, if God said he'll avenge Cain seven times, I'll be avenged 77 times. I'm even more evil than Cain. And he probably had an evil maniacal laugh to go with it as he stirred test tubes in his evil scientific lab. I made that part up. That's not actually in the scriptures. But you get the idea. By the time we hit Genesis 6, we've had a downward spiral. Things are getting worse and worse and worse and worse. And what's the sign that things are really bad? It's not just that people are killing one another. It's the way people's hearts react when they carry out their sinful actions. See, it's not just the fact that Lamech kills someone. It's that he brags about it that makes God say, wow, this world is falling apart. See, here's the thing. Genesis 6 tells us that God sees the inclination or the intentions and the thoughts of every man's heart. And the rest of the scriptures tell us the same thing. That God doesn't merely judge us by our actions, but by the thoughts of our hearts. Jesus says as much in Matthew chapter 5 when he explains, look, you might not kill someone, which is good by the way, please don't kill anybody this week. You might not kill someone, but if you're angry at your brother, that's equivalent to murder. And he also says you might not have committed adultery, but if you've lusted after a woman, if you've looked at someone and had impure thoughts about them, or gone on the internet and looked at things you shouldn't have this week, that's the equivalent, in Jesus' eyes, of having committed adultery in action. The thoughts of our hearts are sinful, not just the actions of our hands. And if that's the case, then maybe we're not so much better off than Genesis 6. If we're honest with ourselves about the bitterness you have towards someone you love right now because of their approach to politics, if you're honest with yourself about the way you've judged someone because of their approach to the pandemic, if you're honest with yourself about the things you mumbled under your breath when you were cut off on the road, or at the anger you're harboring towards an old friend who you've neglected to forgive, 
if the thoughts of our hearts were laid out bare on this beautiful tapestry that we have for every person to see on Sunday morning, none of us would be too eager to have our thoughts displayed. Ron Sider, a Christian author, writes in one of his books, Evangelicals today are living scandalously unbiblical lives. Sider points at just the big sins, the data that shows, for example, at the time of his study, that there was not much of a discernible difference in domestic violence rates between church members and non-church members. What a terrible grief that church members are beating one another. Yet what a terrible grief as well that church members are beating one another up in their own hearts, judging one another in their hearts, angry at one another in their hearts, lustful towards one another in their hearts. The point of Genesis 6 is God sees the intentions of our hearts, and we too, if we're really honest, aren't much better off than Genesis 6, because we haven't killed someone in the past week, but if our looks could kill, maybe we would have. And what's God's reaction to the sin of our hearts? Well, we see it in Genesis 6, 6. The Lord was grieved that he made man on earth. And his heart was filled with pain. Now, expressions of how God feels emotion are a little hard for us to wrap our minds around. Does God grieve like we do? God can't regret, the Bible tells us, he can't regret his decisions. He doesn't want to change the way he did it, and yet he's sad. It's hard for us to wrap our minds around. But what the writer wants to make very clear to us is our sinful actions cause an emotive reaction from God. And that reaction is that his being is filled with grief and pain. Why? Because like we talked about last week, when we cease to live God's way, we're taking his good creation and we're moving it back towards brokenness and chaos and darkness. God is grieved at the sin of our hearts, even the thoughts that we don't act upon, because even the thoughts of our hearts have the capacity to push the world back towards darkness. Even our passive aggression is moving someone away from the light of God. Our sin is really serious. It has serious consequences, and it has a serious effect on God. We might think of it in terms of something you were once really, really proud of. Take, say, a diploma from an institution you attended, or maybe your patch as an Adirondack 46er. You're proud to be associated with this organization, but as time goes on, maybe the organization develops a scandal. They begin to harbor values you don't agree with. They go a totally different direction, and now you look at the diploma or patch hanging on your wall, and suddenly that feeling of pride isn't there anymore. God had once looked at man and said, this is very good. And now he looks at man and says, this pains me to my heart. That is the seriousness of sin. It takes what was so, so good, and it begins to tear it apart from the inside out. So what does God do when he sees that? Well, that's where he takes things to an extent with which we become uncomfortable. Because that's when God says, I will wipe mankind who I created off the face of the earth. And we say, God, hold on. Haven't you heard of the virtue of proportional response? A proportional response in warfare is if an enemy blows up a target, you respond by attacking a target of similar value. If an enemy blows up an old intelligence agency with no people in it and just some old files, you don't respond by kidnapping their president and trying to bomb their capital city. Right? You respond proportionately. And we would say, okay, God, sin is bad, we get that, but wiping out all of humanity, even the animals, what about about the pandas? What did the pandas do? It seems really excessive. This is where we stumble because it doesn't seem fair that God would respond by wiping out all of humanity. But this is where we come back to what we were talking about, where Genesis 6 isn't actually concerned with telling us whether God is fair or not. You can look at other scriptures that explain God's fairness and justice and love. It's hard for us to wrestle together, to put a picture together, and we look at Genesis 6, and it makes sense to say, man, it's it's hard to reconcile a loving God with one who would destroy the earth. But Genesis 6 isn't trying to defend God. God says, look, I'm just, I'm loving, 
And yes, I destroyed the earth. <laughs> and you can wrestle that together with the scriptures. But that's not what Genesis 6 is concerned about. What then is it concerned about? Well, whenever I'm at loss to explain something, as always, I turn to a superhero movie. A couple weeks ago, I told you about Dr. Hank Pym, who had gone back to his old organization, Pym Technology, where he had been the chairman of the board. But now Pym isn't even recognized because he's come off chairman of the board, and now his company is beginning to engage in illicit activity, using the technology he created to greatly endanger the world. So what does Hank Pym do? Well, it's a superhero movie. He blows it up, of course. Hank Pym is so grieved by what's been done with his life's work that he's willing to destroy the work of his life in order that the world might be better for it and that he might begin to recreate it again as he gives his technology to Ant-Man who begins to make the world a better place instead. And God is at work doing the same type of thing. He sees that sin is tearing apart his good world. He's not punishing the world just out of being mad at it. He says this is tearing apart what was good, what was orderly, what is loving. And if I am going to bring this world to what it's supposed to be and bring the promised Messiah, I need to recreate it. And he destroys in order that he might make it new. See, Genesis isn't concerned with telling us here whether God's fair. It's concerned with telling us that God hates sin. And it makes sense to wrestle with the passage. It makes sense to struggle with God's violence. I think we can put together an understanding and defense from other parts of the scriptures. But that's not what the passage is concerned with. It's concerned with telling you, look, God is really, really serious about sin. And sin destroys his world from being what it's supposed to be. And that shouldn't be something that causes us to fear. It should be something that brings us comfort. Because if God hates and judges sin, then that means one day God will make the world right again. Yes, in this time of injustice, in division, in anger, in fake news, we must stand up for what we believe is right. We must call out injustice when it takes place. We must stand up as Christians and call out violence and call out racism and call out sin and stand for justice and speak up for the marginalized, but we can also recognize that if justice isn't enacted on this world, that one day it will be. And when we are wronged by someone else who treats us poorly, we don't need to respond with anger, with vehemence, with getting them back, because if God will one day judge the world, then we know he one day will make it right and we don't have to be the judge. God as judge is actually greatly comforting. But sometimes it can be greatly intimidating. Because if God is a good judge who hates sin, and we're honest with ourselves about the conditions of our hearts, we can look at the sin of our lives and think, oh man, I'm in trouble. We can look at the, violent, uh, the violence that we see in Genesis 6 and think, oh no, I should grovel and fear and tremble before God. He's out to get me. He's going to get me too. But that is where things change in Genesis 6. That is where the good news comes. Because we read in verse 8 that Noah finds favor in the eyes of the Lord. Noah finds favor in the eyes of the Lord. The word favor meaning grace, unmerited, undeserved favor. See, this is different, as a seminary professor pointed out to me, this is different than most of the children's books. The children's books tell you Noah was a good guy. Everyone else was really bad and evil, but Noah was good, so God saved him. But that's not what the Bible says. The Bible tells us in Genesis 6 that Noah did everything as God commanded him, and then God said, go into the ark, I have found you righteous. It doesn't say Noah was really good, so God saved him. It says God found favor on Noah, and then Noah obeyed God. It might sound like the chicken or the egg which came first. Was Noah good so God saved him? Or did God save Noah so he became good? But it's actually a really important question. So let's take a quick look at what the rest of the scriptures say. In Genesis 15, we find the same idea. Abraham believed the Lord, and that was counted to him as righteousness. 
It wasn't that Abram was a good guy, and that's why God made him the one from whom the rest of the Jewish line would come. It's that Abram believed in God, and God counted his belief as righteousness. Hebrews tells us the same thing. By his faith, Noah condemned the world and became the heir of righteousness that comes by faith. See, often when we look at the Old Testament, we look at these people and we think God saved them because they were good. They were good people and they were righteous and that's why God saved them. But that's not how it worked in the Old Testament and it's not how it works today. And the reason this is so crucial is if we think God saved people for being good then, then we'll think he saves us for being good now. But it's not that Noah was good. That's not why he was saved. If, if, you, if you doubt me, take a look at Genesis 8, where God says, I'll never curse the ground again because of man, even though every intention of his heart is evil from his youth. That's the same condemnation in Genesis 6, and it's applied to Noah. In the very next chapter, we see Noah get drunk in his own vineyard and shamefully expose himself, and it brings on another curse into the world. Noah doesn't get saved because he's a good guy. Noah's not a good guy. But God made him good through his faith. And he became righteous by obeying God. See, here's why this is so critical. Is if we think Noah was saved because he was good, we'll think we get saved because we're good. We're not as bad as that person, so God is going to save me. I'm a pretty good person all around, so I'll probably go to heaven. But that's not how it works. Noah wasn't a better person than everyone around him. But Noah believed and obeyed God. And even though you might continue to wrestle with and struggle with sin, even though you might be in an uphill battle, even though you feel like you're back to square one after COVID-19 has hit, the good news of the scriptures is you don't get saved because you're a good person. You get saved if God has favor on you. And here's the implication of that, according to 1 Peter. Peter tells us in chapter 3, In the days of Noah, the ark was being built, and in it only a few people, eight in all, were saved through water. And this water symbolizes baptism that now saves you also. Not the removal of dirt from the body, but the pledge of a good conscience towards God. It saves you by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Here's what Peter is saying. He's not saying baptism saves you. He's saying baptism is a symbol that you've been saved by Jesus Christ. And when Jesus saves you from God's judgment, he doesn't just make you a better person. right? It's not the removal of dirt from your body. You still might struggle with sin. You still won't be a perfect person. You still have a long way to go. But now your conscience is pledged towards God. And because of your faith in Jesus Christ... Just like God looked on Noah's obedience and declared him righteous, God looks on Jesus' obedience and declares you righteous. So even though you may fail, even though you may fall, even though you may wrestle with your sin over and over again, because of your faith in Jesus Christ, God has declared you good. And that is why you can be confident you are saved. That is why God's judgment is not something to fear. We all are deserving of the flood of judgment. But Jesus' death on the cross took the penalty for us. And his resurrection from the grave gives us a new life that we can begin living today. I think this is beautifully illustrated by a movie I watched this past week uh, called Catch Me If You Can. It's a really fun Leonardo DiCaprio and Tom Hanks movie about a con man, Frank Abagnale, fleeing from an FBI agent, Carl Hanratty. And after six years of defrauding banks and stealing millions of dollars, uh, Abigail is finally captured by Hanratty and thrown in prison. But after serving part of his prison sentence, Hanratty invites Abigail to begin working for the FBI. His sentence will be removed on the condition that he begins to work with the FBI and use his skills at check fraud to work in the bank fraud unit of the FBI and identify fake checks. Abigail receives this offer of grace, is freed from prison, and invited to live a new life. But as he begins to do so, the itch to escape comes back. The itch to live his life of sin and crime returns. 
And he leaves and he steals a pilot's uniform and he gets ready to jump on a plane to go back to his life of fraud when Hanratty shows up at the airport. And he says, Frank, I know you'll be back to work on Monday. And Frank says, why would I do that? To which Hanratty responds, look around you. No one is chasing me anymore. See, here's what's different about having a relationship with Jesus Christ. It doesn't mean you never sin again or that you never have the desire to sin again. Like Frank Abagnale, we'll want to walk out and grab that pilot uniform and go back to our old life of crime. But what's different is we don't have to fear consequences that God will one day punish us. If we don't live perfect lives, we're not being chased down by God who's ready to get us and punish us and beat us up. But we are being chased down in love by Jesus Christ who says, wait, come back to me. I have a better offer for you. A life where you don't have to be chased by the consequences of your sin. A life where you can be free from what's been holding you back. A life where instead of living for the thrill of the sin, you can live a transformed life where you never have to fear being chased down by its consequences again. The reality is when we embrace a life of sin, it eventually comes back to eat us. We think we're living free lives, but we're no more free than a goldfish out of a bowl is free from the water. We were created to swim in the goodness of God's world. And when we live his way, moving his world back towards the order and goodness and fullness he made it for, that's when we live the lives we were made to live. Here's what the scriptures tell us from the story of the flood. We're told that God hates and judges sin. And that's intimidating, but it's also a really good thing. It means that one day all will be made right, and the evil and the sorrow and the division and the anger that encapsulates our world will one day be defeated. And when you're wronged or when you're harmed, you don't have to be your own judge or your own avenger. God will one day make all things right. And it's a serious and sobering thing that there will one day be a judgment of the world. And that those who do not have a relationship with Jesus Christ cannot be certain that, that God will bring them into eternity with him. It's crucial that we understand that hell in the scriptures is a real thing. But it's not something you and I have to fear. You don't have to fear that your heart's going to be weighed in the scales when you go to heaven and your good deeds against your bad deeds. No, you can know for sure that God saves and makes righteous those with whom he finds favor... Like he saved Noah, not for being good, but for believing in God. And he saves those, he finds favor with those who have a relationship with Jesus Christ. Yes, God judges sin. Yes, God is serious about your sin. But that's not a cause to fear him. It's a cause to run back to him, just like Frank showed back up to work on Monday. Because the life of true freedom we find is a life that's lived in relationship. Jesus Christ. Here are the implications for us this morning. Firstly, are we serious about our own sin, like God is serious about our sin? Sometimes we can overwrite those little sins, sins of anger or bitterness or irritability or lust or judgment. As long as we don't act upon it and blow our top or get really upset at someone, then it's okay, right? But Genesis tells us God knows the inclinations of our heart. Every thought you've had this week is exposed before your creator. And if we're serious about the consequences of our sin, we realize that even those thoughts are moving the world back towards darkness and hindering our relationship with God and grieving him to his heart. It's important that we're serious, that we look back and identify where am I out of relationship, out of step with Jesus? Am I sinning in anger or worry or fear? or rage, or judgment, or lust. But if we're serious about our sin, we also must be serious about our Savior. Because as serious as our sins are, even the thoughts of our heart, all the more serious is God's offer, that for those who believe in Jesus Christ, there is nothing whatsoever that can ever separate us from his love. And that God can make even the depths of our sins tread in the depths of the sea, all of our iniquities wash whiter than snow. We must be serious about the consequences of our sin, but we must be even more serious about our Savior 
who wants to remove our sin while redeeming the sinner. God is offering an invitation to you through Jesus Christ to yield your sin to him, whether it be the big sin or the little sin, whether it be anger that's consistent and present, or whether it be this little nagging thought of judgment. God is offering to you a way out where nobody is chasing you anymore. Maybe what it means this week is identifying one of those sins that you've grappled with during the COVID fatigue season. Looking back and seeing where is there a pattern of me being judgmental or irritable or angry with strangers or people I love. And the first step might be to yield that to God in prayer, offering it to him and asking for his help and forgiveness. But the second step might be to reach out to a trusted friend and fellow believer in Christ and say, hey, can you keep me accountable to this? Ask me how I'm doing next week. Let's be serious about our sin and about taking steps back towards the arms of our Savior. Not because he'll get really mad at us and get us. No, because no one is chasing you anymore. Except for Jesus Christ running after you in the airport saying, Come back. Come back. I want you to live. Amen. As you go into your week. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Let us live this week in that love.